Hi, it's Dr. Steve from Misericordia University, and welcome to the session, How Do Students Learn? This is part of the instruction for EDU 553, a graduate course in Principles of Instructional Design at Misericordia University. In this video, let's begin by considering a few classroom implications from recent brain research. Then let's consider what is learning and how do people actually learn. And then let's look at how we can apply five principles from brain research, learner attention, active learning, cognitive load, meaning, and emotion. Let's begin by considering what can we learn from brain research. Let's consider some of the classroom implications from recent brain research. Which emotions are hardwired into a child's brain, meaning they don't have to learn them? Joy, sadness, surprise, anger, fear, and disgust. If you have a very young child in your life, uh, you can find them expressing any of these emotions long before they had any experience or uh, an opportunity to learn these emotions. Other emotional responses other than these are learned, like friendship and optimism and, and sympathy, cooperation. All of these things are learned. And that's why, as teachers often refer, the hidden curriculum uh, is a very significant piece, because as teachers, we have to uh, expose our students to these responses and help them to learn how to appropriately respond to different situations. Researchers have learned that the consolidation and encoding of information so that it can be learned and retrieved in long into the future happens during sleep. So in the classroom, it's important to encourage students to get enough sleep. If you're a classroom teacher and you're teaching students under the age of 25, and you will be, realize that the frontal lobes in the brain do not finish developing until around age 25. And this impacts different functions, such as Im impulsiveness, organization of thought and action, or reading of time, reading social cues, predicting behavioral consequences, and also goal achievement. Realize also that a stressful environment can cause the growth to be slowed in the, in the uh, formation of the frontal lobes. So as a teacher, think about setting up systems that can help students who struggle in these areas. Before we get too deeply into looking at how can you properly uh, design instruction, let's go back to the basics. What is learning? What can be said to actually take place during the process of learning? Well, learning is not a thing, like a, like a noun, but rather it's a, it's a process, it's an action. It's the process of the brain storing and retrieving, and, and the retrieval and the storage takes place electrically in neurons, as I have pictured here. And neurons, of course, are billions of cells that do just this. They encode, store, and retrieve information, and they connect together to form networks. And that's how our memories are stored. And if you have a stronger neural network, because electricity is passing from one neuron to another, they form a, a strong connection, and that makes for more uh, easily retrievable memories. So learning ultimately involves making connections between neurons. Neurons that electrically fire together, end up wiring together. Our students don't come to, to us as teachers with a, a blank slate. They all have existing neural networks. So let's show you that. Let's prove that out. If I tell you that Sally took her birthday money and she went to buy something from the ice cream truck, then if I asked you, please tell me more, everyone individually would see a particular picture based on your own neural network.
try it. Think about what age is Sally? Well, we're talking birthday money. Like how much money are we talking? She went to the ice cream truck. What color do you see? What does the truck look like? Are there sounds associated with the truck? What's the placement of this truck? What's the season? How old is Sally? Everyone individually would answer these questions differently. That's because of what we already have built up in our neural networks. If you were to program a computerized device or create an app that would recognize a dog, you can figure that you would have to plug in certain characteristics for that device to look for. So for example, four legs, four paws, it'd be a, a wet nose and a tail. But look at these pictures. This is a dog and our brain can determine that. This is a dog. Now, a computerized device would have trouble figuring this because there's a dog in a mailbox. It's not a usual picture that we see. Here's a cartoon of a dog. And as we're looking at that dog, we're getting different emotions and different feelings and memories that are being evoked by these pictures. This looks like a mean dog. Here's a really mean dog. Here's a noble dog. Here's a dog having fun wearing a hat. This is a dog, even though it's kind of a little abstract. This is also a dog, a hot dog. The way that information is stored in the brain during learning, known as our neural pathway, that's also the way that information will be retrieved. So think about how did you learn the alphabet? Did you sing a song? Many Americans sing A, B, C, D, E, F, G. We, we sing that song and we sing the alphabet in a chronological order. We're going from A through Z. Now, if I were to ask you what comes before M, what comes before X, if you learned it in the forward direction, do you find yourself kind of singing the song and, and running that sequence and trying to just go back a couple letters to the next logical point where you can remember and then running it forward? What happens if you were to learn, as in our modern day, we also have the backwards alphabet? in song, and there are numerous versions of that. If you can learn it in two directions, you can really be quicker with alphabetizing. Technically, you should be able to be twice as fast because you can go in either direction. Think of different things that you do that require your, your brain to just kick in from what it already knows. For example, a sports grip. If you play any sport or ever have, anything that uses any kind of a club or anything that you hold in any way. Can you, for example, um, uh, demonstrate right now your golf uh, grip on the club or the way you hold the bat or whatever other uh, instrument you would use? Even showering. Like what do you do first? Do you do your hair? Do you, do you take the soap and, and start washing your body? If you do, what uh, what hand, which hand do you use to start the soap and where do you start it? And if you're washing your hair first, or if you do it last, as I do, which hand do you hold the shampoo? And in which hand do you gather that shampoo in order to put it on your head? You probably will find that you might have to think about it. Hmm, I wonder what I do. Let me think through it. That's part of your neural network. You have stored that up. Your brain knows what to do, and that way it's more efficient for you. You don't have to rethink how to shower every day of your life. Think when you learned how to drive. Now, for some people, it was a long time ago. For some, not, uh, not so long ago. It was more recent. But when you first learned to drive, you were very focused on driving. At this point in time, after a period of time passes, your neural network is so strong, you could... Uh, play with the radio and fiddle with your map program and so on. Now, you shouldn't be doing this when you're driving, but you technically could do it, although you shouldn't. It's because you now have built up a strong neural network. One last example for now. 
Pause the video and see if you can read this. Most brains are able to read this, provided that the first and the last letters of each word are in the appropriate places. The brain is an amazing instrument. At one point in time, it was believed that memory was static. It was like storage on a hard drive in a, in a computer. But at this point, we know that that's not true at all. The brain is a dynamic tool. It constantly arranges and rearranges these networks to accommodate incoming information. Imagine all of the information that bombards a brain throughout one day. If we were to consciously pay attention to all of these data, uh, we would be on overload and ultimately we would not be able to process much of that information at all. So sometimes for the better and sometimes not for the better, the brain filters out any information that it finds not useful or unimportant or not relevant. So this material never gets encoded and it never gets stored. At one point in history, uh, it was thought that the brain stored everything and it was all in there somewhere. But now we know that's not true. It may have been uh, information stimulus was taken in through the senses, but if the brain filtered it out, it never got recorded. A challenge for teachers as well as instructional designers is that unfortunately a lot of the information that is taught fits into the, one of these categories. If the learner's brain does not see fit to store or retain information, uh, or if it doesn't understand the information at the time of encoding, then it seems irrelevant and it is not encoded. So the process of learning goes something like this. Some new stimulus comes into the senses and the person's brain searches existing neural networks to see where does this and if this information, this new stimulus, fits in. Now, if it does fit in to the schema, the learning is said to have taken place because the brain now fits that into existing information. If it's considered by the brain irrelevant, not useful, or unimportant, or something not understood, it gets discarded and never makes it in. Thus, learning has not taken place. Here's a challenge to think about as you start designing instruction and look toward preparing a sound instructional product. Consider your audience and your content. What can you do to motivate learners to regard the new information they're about to learn and see it as important, relevant, and useful? As you design instruction, think about incorporating this into your training product to ensure that learners are in the best position to encode this information and to truly learn this content. Having considered some learnings from brain research and how they apply to the classroom and to learning, now let's take a look at how we can directly apply some of these principles. As an overview, let's consider these elements. Let's look at maintaining learner attention, involving students in active learning, be careful so we don't cognitively overload learners, and then let's capitalize on meaning and emotion. As our first application of what we learned from brain research, let's focus on the importance of attention. Attention is, as Bob Gagné has pointed out, the first step in the learning process. Because if the brain is not paying attention, information will not get encoded and there's no chance or very little chance for retention in memory. Also, we have to look at the fact that the human brain is programmed to focus on loud noises or sudden movements. Here I have a caveman um, pictured because these were survival techniques. So the brain is highly responsive to something new and different, some movement, something that's loud that you can hear. 
in, in an educational product or in the classroom. Think about gaining learner attention at the beginning of a lesson and also as often as needed throughout instruction. When you're using uh, electronic tools, <clears throat> think about incorporating attention-getting devices, especially those that apply to sound and or movement in your materials so that you can uh, capitalize on the concept of attention. Also, remember that gaining attention is more than just the sights and the sounds and the movements, but uh, it could also be an intellectual stimulation. You could spark curiosity as much as the, the more basic level of attention getting, and that can also be powerful. A second major learning from brain research is involving students in active learning. When you look at this chart, notice that verbal experiences I put up toward the top of this ladder. And uh, if you look at direct experiences, that's on the opposite end. That's down at the beginning of the ladder. If, as teachers, we had the time and we could give direct experience and engage all senses in all content, uh, learners would absolutely be achieving at their highest uh, level. But when we look at it, we, we just don't have time to give direct experience. And sometimes we just can't provide direct experience in some areas of content. As we move up the ladder, um, simulated experiences still work very well. Vicarious experiences where students are watching video or, or they're doing something where they, they, they're they feel like they're doing it, but they're not actually physically directly doing it. That's also very effective. Then we're starting to move up higher on the ladder, which is the rickety part of the ladder. If you've purchased a ladder in about the last 10 years from the home improvement stores, you'll notice the very top step on the ladder says, don't step here because you may die. Unfortunately, visual experiences, verbal experiences, these these teaching methodologies that engage only one sense, that's where the majority of instruction in many classrooms takes place. That's the rickety end of the ladder. Realize that the most effective, long-lasting learning, the ones that engage the many senses and are interdisciplinary and it's authentic and it's more hands-on and more concrete rather than abstract and more symbolization, that's down at the bottom area of the ladder. So the bottom line here is nothing wrong with verbal and visual, but if we can engage students more actively in learning, as pictured here on the bottom of the ladder, uh, learning will have a much better chance to occur. When we talk about active learning, students are actively working to construct their knowledge. They could be conversing, they're performing some type of tasks, they're engaged mentally, emotionally, and sometimes hands-on, physically doing something. Passive learner is the much more traditional model of education, where it's teacher-centered instruction, and students are listening to lecture and just taking notes and memorizing, and maybe doing some drill and practice. Think about, are your students actively involved in the thinking-learning process? As we're preparing to design effective instruction, keep in mind that it is the student's responsibility to actively participate in learning. And not all learning is going to be fun, but all learning needs to be meaningful, and we learn that from brain research. And if we engage students by requiring them to reconstruct the knowledge that they acquire, that's a very positive, active strategy. In the classroom, think about allocating passive activities to homework and then use class time for the active learning experiences, the hands-on activity, the group experiences. If you're preparing uh, an online or computer-based training module, then we have to think about that challenge. How can we make the, act, the, the actions of the students be more active rather than just sit back and watch the presentation type of scenario. A third priority from brain research to incorporate into teaching and training is be aware of cognitive overload and don't overload the students. Using some historic research, 
Miller's what he calls magical number, which is seven plus or minus two elements or chunks of content. Use that as a guide when designing instruction. Help students chunk information into, into larger elements, but fewer elements. To do this, we can use uh, mnemonic devices, but do not provide more than the magical number of elements and expect students to remember these things. Miller's research, I put the full name of his research up here, um, took place in 1956. So it's foundational and it still holds today. Uh, he found that memory span of young adults was found to be, again, seven plus or minus two. And those were elements. So an element could be a word, it could be one letter, it's some type of unit, but seven plus or minus two means uh, on the low end, students can retain five elements. On the high end, and it's getting even a little sketchy on that high end, it could be nine elements, and you're gonna lose a lot of students at that level. Some more recent research suggests that the magical number in today's day and age may need to be revised downward. Uh, in some cases, some research researchers suggest even as low as two to four chunks of information. Let's put the magical number into perspective. This scene right here, an airplane cockpit console, could strike a lot of fear in the hearts of a lot of people because they're looking and they're seeing maybe 100 different dials and they don't know what they're all about. But someone who has learned about how to be a pilot and has studied will see different chunks. For example, there's the standard instrument cluster. There's the autopilot section. There's the throttle quadrant. Now, here's the engine uh, pieces and gauges. And, and finally, we have the uh, landing gear. So here I'm looking at three, four, five, six elements. Hey, that's still within the magical number. And then within that, uh, these, these, these quadrants, these groupings, these chunks, we can also find that there are other elements that we can elaborate on. One other quick example. If you ever wanted to learn to play the piano, if you didn't, chances are you looked at this keyboard, you could see a piano keyboard right here. Uh, it looks very scary because all you're seeing are tons of keys, 88 keys. Well, if we were to chunk that down, we could bring it within the magical number. One octave is, on the piano keyboard, is letter C all the way through letter B. So we're looking at uh, eight keys there and 13 if you add in the five black keys. So you can see a unit there and then another unit after. If you chunk it this way, and we look at it on the piano keyboard, you can see octave, 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 and so on. And this way, when a musician approaches this, he or she is not intimidated. Uh, this brings, this chunking process brings this down within the magical number. One last demonstration of the magical number. How do you remember your phone number? Well, when dial-up phones, and these were rotary dial at the time, were being implemented in this country by the Bell Telephone Corporation, they were doing this in the 50s, 1950s, which is around the time of Miller's uh, research on a magical number. And the phone company did not believe that the average citizen could remember all of those numbers. So, for example, a Nanticoke, Pennsylvania number would have two letters, which would be one chunk. Like in Nanticoke, it was Regent 5. So there was one chunk, Regent 5. Of course, we know that R and E would be 7, 3, and then 5, and then four more digits that you would have to learn. Now, in today's world, we know that learners have been able to process a whole lot more digits. But when we look at this, these numbers still are within the uh, Miller's magical number because 570 is our local area code. And then if we have 735 or Dallas 674, that's one chunk. And then the brain has to process those last four.
four digits. How did you learn the alphabet? Well, we already said it was probably by chunking the letters and probably through song. Can you retell what you saw, like a story or a whole movie or a book? You can. Now, you're not going to remember all the intimate details of any of those, those items, but you will chunk it down and remember sections. So this is part of how the brain works. A fourth item we can draw from brain research and apply it to learning is meaning. Remember that learners are not just like absorbers, like sponges absorbing information. Uh, they're active participants in learning. They're creating new neural pathways and, con and connecting new information to existing knowledge. Therefore, new learning depends on previous experience. This is why the educational researcher Robert Gagné, in his nine significant events in instruction model, which we're going to learn about more in this course, states that starting a, when you start a lesson, you need to help the learners recall their previous knowledge, help them remember what they already know and activate that knowledge before delivering new information. That respects the way the brain works in acquiring new information. Respect prior knowledge. Don't assume that students understand something clearly. Help them check it out because the brain is a pattern-seeking organ. If it doesn't understand something, it's going to try to figure it out and it could get it wrong. Think about when you look up in the sky and you see clouds. There aren't really patterns, like intentional patterns up there, but yet you may see them because your brain is always trying to figure things out and seek patterns. There's a story told about uh, a child who learned about the mathematical term a set. But when the child was learning in school, the teacher used markers and stood them up, different colored markers, in understanding sets. When the child came home, the parent, who was also a teacher, said, well, tell me what you learned. Well, I learned about sets. So the and parent understood that, that the student was learning with markers. So the parent brought some markers out and laid them down and, and asked, well, it's, does this make up a set? And the student replied, no, it doesn't. But it did. Yeah, but the problem was the student didn't realize the way the information was taught was that the markers were standing up. So this student's brain processed that as when the markers are standing up, they're part of a set. If they're lying down, that's not a set. And we know that that's erroneous understanding of things. That's why we have to respect prior knowledge. Because sometimes learners have to correct something they've already learned. And then we work to connect new information with their existing information. A great way to bridge the learner's existing knowledge with new information and help them fit it into their schema is through the use of metaphors and analogies. For example, maybe in high school at some point you learned about electrical circuits and maybe the uh, metaphor was flowing water through a, a plumbing system because the learner already knows what it looks like to have water flowing and coming out of a spigot and faucet and so on. Um, if they can compare this to electrical circuits, now they can simply bridge the gap, in other words, the part that they don't quite understand. And they can now fit the new information into and onto what they already know. Now realize that if there's little or no previous experiential knowledge, then we have to use ideally concrete experience. We, we have to help the learner get some experience with this if they have nothing to build upon already. And that's why problem-based learning, case studies, hands-on activities are very, very helpful. The last area that we're going to focus on in this video in terms of applying something directly from brain research is the research about emotion. Emotion is a very powerful tool for learning and for memory. Let's go into the brain for a moment. The amygdala is a set of two, about the size of an almond, structures. And they're associated with the lower part of the brain, uh, the, the brain stem, and they regulate emotion. 
So because they're associated with the brainstem, it means that they've been here since the beginning of humankind in our ancient ancestors. So they're, they're, they're part of our um, fight or flight. They're, they're part of our emergency response to things. These organs release adrenaline, and that's what triggers the stress response. Think about the fact that emotion strongly influences memory. Think about where you were when different things happened, either in the world or in your own life. For example, when the World Trade Center bombing took place, or some warring activity, or some of the recent things we've seen with uh, in our country, different uh, areas of unrest. What were you doing? Can you, can you picture what were you wearing? Where did you hear of these events? What did you feel? What did you smell? What did you hear in the room? It becomes so real, you can almost picture that you were still there, and it's like a video running live in your memory. Here's another one. Let's go into your personal life. Recall an experience, something you remember from an early grade, like kindergarten or first or second grade. Take a moment. See what you can remember. Chances are it's going to be some event that also uh, encoded with it was a strong memory, a strong, sorry, a strong feeling, a strong emotion, and that's in your memory too. Like, for example, maybe... Uh, something embarrassing happened, or a great, uh, uh, you, you were recognized, like you got an award, or, or something very happy, or you made a friend, or you dropped and broke something. It, it doesn't matter if the emotion was a happy emotion or a sad emotion, or any other emotion. The point is that you had a strong emotion associated with that event. Because of that, you can remember the event very clearly. In fact, the stronger the emotion, the stronger the memory. To illustrate this dramatically, let's consider the impact of the amygdala in a very young child, because the hippocampus in the brain is not fully functional until age two. So long-term memories of events prior to age two are not very likely. But yet, the child may have had a negative experience in some way and they will still be impacted by the emotional uh, impact from that experience, even though they, they don't actually have a uh, recall of what the event was. Let's look at an example. Let's consider the example of an infant in a crib in a very negative home environment who maybe experiences some bugs, some insects walking over him or her. Now, the child won't have a memory of what was going on, but the fear or other emotions that impacted that child at that point in time under the age of two will still be there. The amygdala are very powerful. So it could be realized in the classroom years later as some kind of radical behavior, maybe biting or fighting, when it seems like there's no logical reason for it. But some type of stimulus causes that, that reaction to be triggered. It is possible for the emotions in a situation to take over and override your thinking and really short circuit the thinking part of the brain. Some researchers refer to this as an amygdala hijack of your brain. So realize the amygdala can be negative but if they're capitalized on by a teacher and an instructional designer in positive ways, the amygdala and the emotions can really, in positive ways, impact learning and memory. So what are the positive and negative impacts and effects of emotion in the classroom or in learning situations? Well, a big positive is that any activities educationally that engage the student emotionally, and they're motivated and they're very interested and excited to learn, these lead to more vivid memories and much easier to recall down the road. Now, the negative side is that realize that stress can lead to what uh, 
what neuroscientists refer to as downshifting to the reptilian brain. In other words, when stress comes in, memory uh, is not the highest function of the brain at that time uh, in terms of the importance. If there's fight or flight response going on, memory is not going to be the thing that takes over. Uh, in fact, the rational problem-solving part of the brain it will not function quite the same. Think of people who are on game shows and they say, I can, I can do this all the time. Uh, I can play this game and win at home. But then when they get on TV, their stress is high and they really physically cannot compete that way anymore because stress causes the, the memory to now turn, turn off or take a, it doesn't turn off, but it, it goes down to like a, a back burner, so to speak. So in the area of education, let's both eliminate the negatives and let's accentuate the positives. The negative would be, let's foster an environment where students feel safe. Because realize that the brain does not distinguish between physical and psychological danger. That's why amusement park rides are exciting to people. That's why scary movies are exciting to people. When they see something bad about to happen to a character on the TV or on the movie screen, they feel in their brain that, well, maybe I'm in danger too. And the person gets excited over that process. Let's eliminate the negative things in the learning environment. And let's accentuate the positives. Let's intensify students' emotional state because that will enhance both meaning and memory. Now, it doesn't matter what type of emotion, as we pointed out. It could be emotions of, of uh, uh, in, intense positive feelings. It could be, uh, it could be negative feelings. It could be um, uh, other types of... It doesn't matter the, the emotion. That's why simulations and role-playing and real-life problems uh, or interviewing people who have lived through different events and, and showing that, sharing that with students, that's why those things really work well because they play into the, into the emotional state of the learner and that enhances both meaning and memory. Here is the challenge for the instructional designer as well as for the teacher. Do the audience analysis and examine the content you expect to deliver. Identify some possible negatives that may arise or may exist as learners approach your training product. And then brainstorm some possible solutions to address these negatives because we already found that negative emotion will negatively impact learning. On the other end, identify some positive elements that could create an aesthetically pleasing, positive environment or motivational, uh, very motivating environment for these, for these learners. And then brainstorm how you could capitalize on that as you develop instruction. Another part of the challenge is consider your audience, consider the content, and then determine how you could incorporate emotion more into this lesson to increase their understanding, their engagement, and their vivid memories. And keep in mind, any type of emotion will work, but if you use negative emotions like fear or sadness, just be careful because you don't want to tip the scale so strongly in the negative direction that now the amygdala hijack the brain and learning stops or becomes less efficient. As a short review, in this video we considered how the brain functions, how learning takes place, and we, we got a, a little view of some of those processes. And then we really focused on what can we take from brain research into learning and teaching. And several points were very significant. Learner attention active learning. Don't cognitively overload the learners. Remember the Miller's magical number. Meaning is very significant because the brain is a pattern-seeking uh, organ. And finally, capitalize on emotion, both eliminating the negative emotions, which could be a hindrance to learning and memory, 
and also accentuating the positive aspects of emotion that can lead to vivid memories and very long-lasting memory of the content. This week, we're going to have four remote class activities. The first one is a wiki designing for emotion. I've provided links to two articles on Blackboard. Let's work together and collaboratively let's generate a list of practical ways to incorporate the results of this research on emotions into our instructional products. Offer practical suggestions and or examples. Remember that we want to evoke emotions and we also want to promote the positive feelings about our designs. Our second remote class activity will be to write a brief paper on designing to reduce cognitive load. I've provided an article that's aimed at instructional design for medical education. So what we're aiming for here is a two to three page double spaced paper. In this paper, briefly describe the three types of cognitive load that are described in the article. Then choose three of the design principles that are also described in the article and describe what each one means and suggest how an instructor can assimilate that principle into designs of educational products. In other words, how can I practically use this when I'm designing educational instructional products? Now, keep in mind, uh, I've given uh, some idea of, of what to focus on here. You do not have to use any additional resources, you don't have to cite any other articles, simply use the content in this article and apply the material. Our, our third activity will be a discussion, Insights on Designing to Support Student Learning. In instruction this week, through this video, we discussed how designing educational products to make more effective learning includes incorporating information from brain research, such as learner attention, cognitive load, the magical number, meaning, and emotion. Now, let's hold an online discussion of insights that you gain or tips that you can give in designing instructional products to support more effective student learning. Our fourth and final remote class activity for this week will be participating in a wiki called the First Principles of Instruction. And this is based on the research of Robert Merrill, one of the gurus in instructional design. And he's focused on how people learn and how to best design instruction to make learning more effective and efficient. I've provided an article. In this article, Merrill specifies and describes five principles of effective instruction and instructional design. Select one of those first principles. In the wiki, let's all describe one principle and its implication for the positive design of instruction. Next week, at our next class, let's start diving into the process of instructional design. Let's look at the front end analysis, the elements of needs assessment and also audience analysis.